We're going to move over to talk about data centers, something that featured in Francis's talk. Steve-O, are you ready? Go for it. UK kids are learning about open source software, sustainability and the SDGs in Open UK's Kids Camp and using digital gloves to learn to code. Every time they log on, make a video call or play a game, they're using data processed in a data centre. Data centres are a source of carbon emissions which adversely impact our planet using energy and generating heat. The more the world digitalises, the bigger the problem is. Something needs to be done, so Open UK is using open technology, software, hardware and data to make a difference, creating the carbon negative data centre of the future. A circular model across six key areas, buildings, energy, hardware, network, operations and regulatory environment. This could reduce carbon emissions by up to 80% and materials used by up to 90%. Gaps or holes in the blueprint patchwork are filled by collaboration. That's the nature of open and communities. Tech doesn't fix problems, it enables solutions. Open UK's collaboration and community, even the blueprint itself, will keep evolving. Evolving. As COP26 is in Glasgow, we've chosen a Scottish project name for the blueprint, Patchwork Kilt. You're not meant to fly to COP26, you know, kids. <clears throat> Patchwork Kilt needs less space, allowing use of abandoned and underutilised buildings and towns. With 5G and edge-based networks, it brings the data centre closer to the end user. It outlines the journey to get to 100% renewable energy. You can use less hardware and then extend its life, so we don't need to extract new materials from the earth. We can try it out in Dundee, using the data centre energy generated by Dundee's gaming communities to provide the heat for the new Eden project because Patchwork Kilt is open. It's freely available. Anyone can use it all over the UK and across the globe. Open UK's Patchwork Kilt data centre of the future will be homed at the Eclipse Foundation, who will manage contributions in the future. It will help to support a carbon negative and sustainable future for the planet. So everybody, I'm going to ask you exactly to give a big round of applause. And we're going to let the kids go before we get technical. So as they leave the room, if anybody who's standing would like to sit down, there are some seats at the far side. Um, I'm pretty psyched that we're standing room only, but if you want to sit down, feel free. So for our next session, we're going to look at the blueprint for the data center of the future. And I'm going to hand you back over to Christian Perino, who obviously needs no more introduction. Hello again, everyone. I suspect that the animation will do a much better jo job than, than I will. But let's start with a couple of numbers. 4% of global GHG emissions today to 8% by 2025. That's the direction that the global ICT industry is going in right now. There's something wrong with that. The data centers are the backbone to this industry. We need to not only decarbonize them, but we need to dematerialize them. And that's the challenge that Open UK and its international par partners have taken on. We've created this carbon negative data center blueprint, and yes, I still need to look down and read it when, when I say this, or the patchwork kilt as we're now calling it, with some ambitious targets behind it. You just heard we're looking to achieve up to 80% decarbonization and up to 90% dematerialization. Those are ambitious target, but that's what the blueprint lays, lays out a journey for. You also heard that we're looking at six connected buckets, as I call them, or, or areas. We go from buildings to energy to hardware and software to network to operations and also regulatory environment. These are all connected through a circular model that can only be enabled by open principles and open technology. Now, in the first version of this blueprint, we've, we're focusing heavily on local and we're focusing heavily on refurbishing buildings. So if we look across, I think there's a drawing somewhere right out there. So if we look across, for example, the building bucket 
and the network bucket, there's two converging trends happening right now. We're seeing 5G and edge-based networks being deployed closer to end users. And at the same time, in city centers and town centers, we're seeing retail and office space either abandoned or underutilized. So taking on a refurbished approach, in the, uh, as a first instance, is actually eliminating carbon heavy materials from the build of new data centers. But it's also introducing a number of dynamics that integrates the data center back in the community. For example, if we look at the excess heat and water that data center cooling systems tend to emit, we can redirect that excess heat and water back into the grid and then offer affordable services to underprivileged communities. At the same time, in the hardware and software bucket, we're looking to refurbish underutilized high-end equipment from the hyperscalers. And for those of you who aren't in tech, we're talking about the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazon. And then recertifying them so they're open, they're fixable locally, so they're lo they can be fixed by local people. And life is extended, so we're delaying the use of new, the, the need to draw new materials from the earth as long as possible. Now, because we're still talking about um, dematerialization in addition to decarbonization, there's a saying in the tech space that software eats hardware. Well, this is a perfect example of it, because we would only be using a fractional amount of the hardware required in traditional data centers to support this growing need of, of data. Now, the supply chain is critical. The supply chain typically captures over 90% of a data center's emission. This is also the, the, the part of the problem that's the most difficult to fix. Transparency here is fundamental. And transparency can only be achieved by combining hard, open so data with open software and regulatory intervention. If we look at the operations bucket, somewhere towards the middle bottom, Again, because we've chosen a path of refurbished buildings that are centrally located, we're creating jobs for local communities which are much more accessible. At the same time, we're reducing the need for fleet operations. So when we talk about electrification of the fleet, we're no longer thinking about one for one replacement. And then finally, the energy bucket. I talked about heat redirect. The energy bucket outlines a journey to achieve 24-7, 100% renewable energy. This isn't an overnight journey. So the things that we take into account are carbon offsetting, local storage systems, and power purchase agreements backed by transparency. Now, a word of caution when we talk about carbon offsetting. And I need to do this because I'm seeing way too much VC money going into the space. Carbon's offsetting is a transitional solution. It needs to be phased out. We can't allow offsetting to become the excuse to continue doing what we're doing. You may not like me as much in a few seconds. This leads me to a personal discomfort uh, from being a cop over the last week and a half. There's an elephant in the room, and it's called growth. And to be specific, it's perpetual growth. And it's becoming blatantly obvious that the climate agenda has been hijacked by the billionaires and the corporates who are interested in investing in a version of net zero, in a flavor of net zero, that protects consumption and growth. So let me be clear on one thing. As, as long as we, as we don't switch the measure of success from perpetual growth to the health and well-being of all people and of the planet, no net zero can be sustainable. Now, there's tens of thousands of young people, mostly women, who have poured onto the streets to make this point as clear as it can be. And frankly, they belong in the decision rooms. With that, let me introduce you to the best part of the session. As my panelists look at me in fear. Lucy, Leanne, Max, and Amanda, can you please join me on stage? So I was going to do a lengthier introduction, but I'm going to go with the flow uh, and the lead. But 
Um, when we talk about six buckets, the breadth of expertise never lays in one organization. And we have an unbelievable breadth of expertise here on the panel. We have Lucy from um, Octopus Energy Center for Next Zero. We have Leanne from Everledger. Max from the, again, this is one of the ones I have to read, the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance. And then we have our host and CEO of Open UK, Amanda, who's actually been the driving force behind this. What inspired you to take, to take on data centers? So one of the things that inspired me was heat, which I'm feeling in this room right now. Um, just as an aside, there's nothing we can do about it. It's the sun, not a problem you generally have in Glasgow. But heat's also a problem in data centers. And I was listening to what was going on. To be really honest, I, I don't know a lot about sustainability. I know I want a better planet. I know that I want things to be more equitable and fairer. So I, I started to look into it a little bit, but I'm no expert. What I am an expert in, if I'm an expert in anything, is open. And I get to talk to all these different amazing people who tell me, people like John LeBan, who tell me about these mad projects they're working on, different organizations and what they're doing. And I guess, like the patchwork kilt sort of idea itself, I get to mesh things together. You know, I've got a scattered mind and I see all these different things and want to pull them together. And that's kind of what I did. I pulled together people who I knew could bring together elements that I thought one's collective would really have some power. So th that was what inspired me, Christian. Thank you. And Lucy, I've had the opportunity to learn a little bit about the work you're doing with Octopus Energy, which is fascinating. I think everyone would benefit from understanding how um, renewable-centered grids are going to be optimized and what the role of local is, because that's, that's a big part of this blueprint as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Christian. Um, so that's a really big question. But um, maybe just to very quickly introduce the work of Center for Net Zero, um, we are using data-driven modeling and simulation to investigate faster, fairer, and more affordable paths to net zero. Um, and we're specifically focused on the energy transition and future energy systems. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things that's quite uh, unique about our approach is we're taking a very kind of people-centered approach. So the modeling we're doing is very much bottom up. So it's um, particularly focused on people and households. Uh, and when we think about future energy systems, people and households will uh, play a much bigger role. They'll have much more participation than they might have done uh, in years past. And this is because uh, they will begin to adopt a lot of uh, things that we call low carbon technologies. So some things like electric vehicles, they're, they're examples of uh, low carbon technologies. Um, electric heat pumps, solar panels that you might have uh, on, on, your, on your roof. Uh, home batteries, smart thermostats, these will all be part of the future energy system. Uh, and this means that we'll have a future energy system which is uh, far more decentralized than it has been in the past, far more distributed than it has been in the past, um, but importantly, there will be much more data and digital in the system. Um, and this provides us with all sorts of opportunities. Um, and I think I'm probably remembering this, this sentence uh, incorrectly from the video we just saw, but I think there was a nice line that said something like, um, technology is not the answer to the problem, it's the enabler of solutions. And I think that's exactly the right way uh, of thinking about what we will see in the future. Um, to answer your question about renewables coming into the system, and how that might change the system. Um, one, of the, one of the kind of inherent characteristics of renewables, if we think about things like wind and solar PV, is that they're intermittent in nature. We can't control them and, and turn them up and down in, in the same way that we can with fossil fuel-based uh, uh, electricity, uh, because they depend on the weather. So um, we can't control how windy it is or how sunny it is. Um, and so this means that uh, generation is more intermittent. Um, uh, and uh, when we talk about the electricity grid, 
Uh, one, of the, one of the things that's very important for the grid is to keep it in balance. So this means, uh, you know, in the UK, we try to operate the grid between 50 to 60 hertz. Um, and this is important because uh, if the grid's not in balance, uh, it can lead to um, things like blackouts, for instance. Um, so to keep it in balance and under a renewable system, which is more intermittent, um, one of the things we can do is to look at all the assets on the system and um, to really apply, um, use this digital and data and actually to optimize the system in a very kind of intelligent, uh, digitally, uh, you know, digitally informed way. Um, so uh, that's kind of uh, one of the things that we will, we will be able to do um, using digital, using data, importantly having um, open data where we need to, to enable uh, that kind of optimization. Um, maybe, I don't know if I should leave it there for now, because I'm sure we can probably come back to this in, in, in the rest of the conversation. Absolutely. I mean, I already have a handful of conversations, but this is going to turn into you and I speaking, so let's not do that. So Leanne, I mean, Everledger obviously does a lot of work with supply chains and bringing transparency to it. And scope three emissions is such a huge part of decarbonizing a data center. What are the, what are the sort of things that we should look out for? What sort of things should we be implementing either from a technology or regulatory perspective? Look, in a very short period of time, we began in the heart of London in 2015, and uh, we began tracing diamonds from the source of the mine right the way through to the retail network. And the entirety of our world uh, resides on the principles of provenance. Where does it come from? Where does it go to? And where is it now? And the fundamentals of that to enable the change of an entire industry requires the alignment, quite simply, of value and values. How do you align an industry or a set of supply chains in the alignment of value creation? And some of that can be in the pre-competitive space, like we're seeing right now in sustainability and climate. We should not be racing into this with large corporates to suggest that if we are the first to achieve a scope one or a scope two reporting, then it's our competitive advantage. Why are we competing against the survival of the planet. Uh, and so I think the dialogue, particularly in the hard things about the hard things, which is really scope three, how do we bring the entirety of a sub global supply chain? They will still exist regardless of changing infrastructure in a local environment. Supply chains are global. So how do we think about this global, global and local balance and bringing that alignment of value and value creation together? And that feeds into my obsession with growth, right? And this is a question for all of you, but I'm gonna start with you, Max. How, I mean, right now we've obviously focused on the two important immediate wins, which is decarbonization and dematerialization. But should there be a role in a blueprint for managing growth? Is all growth good? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting question right now, I think. If you look at the, the current conversation, and, and all of us, we, we represent to a certain extent the software uh, world, right? There's, there's a big momentum for saying software will solve all of, its pro all of our problems today, right? Software will solve climate change, um, models, data, all these things, we've heard them earlier today, but ultimately software is weightless by itself. It only becomes, gets a footprint um, if you look at the infrastructure. And then all of a sudden, this idea of infinitely adding more software, building more software, if you connect it to that physical infrastructure, it, the growth of it becomes a lot more difficult. And fundamentally, I, I think it's important to recognize that the technologies that are in this blueprint exist, right? Refurbished hardware exists, heat recycling and data centers ex exist, demand response, uh, so, so shifting power loads basically around from data centers, it exists. All of what is in the blueprint is available today. So then eventually you start wondering why is it not happening? And I, I heard the word collaboration today a lot and, and it's part of the open values, which I also really support. And I think it is collaboration, yes, but we also have to be really honest that changing digital infrastructure, fiber data centers and making them sustainable, we are still a very long way away from that because we don't, the software community doesn't really think about it so much, but it's, it's really important because again, it is what adds weight to software. It's the physical embodiment of software, um, and we need to pay more attention in a way to that and, and collaborate with the physical um, world as well. 
So basically, the world of silos that we currently have and then closed systems just isn't doing anyone any favors. Yes. So I, th I see my panelists are being very polite. I did tell them at the beginning that they can challenge each other, interject, ask questions, and, and even the biggest personalities in the, in the room right now are being very polite. So Leanne, I'm going to throw a same type of question. Is all growth good, and is there anything this blue should, should look out for? Look, I when think enabling it. growth is good when you link it to learnings. And obviously, that's what we're going through right now. Um, economically, our model is very clear that uh, it's not sustainable uh, long term, whether it be for the sustainability of the planet, the biodiversity, or even the economics. Um, so I fundamentally think, and uh, I am one of the global chairs at the World Economic Forum, and a number of years ago, there was a significant focus on stakeholder value, the creation of the differential between shareholder value and stakeholder value. Um, and so when we think about an organization, it's not just only the return of capital back to shareholders and even ensuring that employees are, are well positioned and everyone has a right to a, a living wage, but it's who else are the stakeholders of my business? Um, and it is the environment around me, it's the environment that I impact back out to that scope three environment that we're talking about. And if we're sourcing materials from countries, then don't plant a tree in New York where the diamond is sold. Go back to where the travesty has occurred. And so we're seeing this, um, you know, this sort of juxtaposition of the, the need and the want and the desire, um, but still running really fast on a treadmill. And I just wonder if we manage to take a breather, like potentially we have done here at COP26, and reflect for a moment, what could be those learnings that we take forward from it? And Lucy, when we first had a conversation and I shared my frustrations around what I've seen at COP, you had a different outlook, a more positive outlook, because you've been in some of those rooms. Do you want to share some of those thoughts? Yeah, I, I think I'm a natural, I'm a natural optimist anyway, actually. And, uh, you know, having a long background in tech, the so <laughs> uh, having, a, having a, a long background in tech, I think w one of the things you, you see is that Change, change is possible. So you see it in different contexts, um, but I think you kind of then bring that to things like the, the climate challenge, climate emergency, and um, uh, you might not be able to quite see the path, but you can certainly convince yourself that um, a, a bunch of people can get in a room and find some common ground and, and, and that there will be a positive outcome. So um, I think I've particularly enjoyed um, some of the participation from younger people in the conference. I loved the session we had earlier. Um, uh, a huge congratulations to, I don't know if it, that was Amanda's idea, whose idea that was, but oh, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, I've had some really good conversations with, with younger people. And, um, uh, you know, let's face it, in 10 years' time, uh, the likes of Femi and others will be the people on the stage at COP, and they will be calling the shots and making the key decisions. Um, and so I think that's fantastic. Uh, they uh, really think about these issues in a, in a very different way, maybe to, to my generation and other generations. Um, and we're here talking about digital and data. These, this generation is a digital native generation, um, and I think they will bring some very creative ideas and thinking and uh, really exploit some of the opportunities that uh, data and technology can bring to, to enable solutions here. So um, that's, that's why I've, I've probably had a slightly different take on things. Oh, I like it. I mean, I may not be the first person to jump onto the positive aspects, but I like to call out the negatives sometimes. So uh, Leanne and Max, since you, see, you both see this, there's a lot of data going through the data center for a lot of different applications. Is there anything you feel should be called out like, you know, flavors of crypto, for example. <laughs> oh, he loves poking my ribs, absolutely. I knew it was coming, I just didn't know when. If you're when. not gonna it do it to yourselves, I'll do it end. to you, so. <laughs> Look, I was hugely attracted and remain to be attracted to the movement of um, blockchain as an underlying infrastructure, and I fundamentally believe we're moving from what we once knew was the World Wide Web to the World Wide Ledger, and that will start to drive transparency in ways not just only in physical supply chains or the physical provenance of goods, but the digital provenance of data is going to become even more critically important. Um, cryptocurrency, the reason why I was attracted to blockchain is because the principles of it is an open source. I mean, we reside as an application, Everledger, on top of the Hyperledger open source platform, driven heavily with the Linux Foundation. Um, and we can see that the collective nature of that community uh, is able to solve some significant problems. Now, a blockchain is not just a blockchain or the blockchain, or there are various different 
uh, regionalities of technologies that come together to be able to underpin either cryptocurrency or digital currency um, and or the work that we do, which is probably more boring and traditionalist in terms of bringing transparency to very opaque, conflicted supply chains. Um, we, this distributed, ledging, led, uh, distributed technologies um, and edge computing is actually here today, and that's problematic. So more so than ever, the problem is going to be distributed globally in such a prolification, it's near impossible to be able to hold on and find every tentacle in the octopus. Whilst we start thinking about infrastructure changeouts in centralised hosting environments, or looking to the big five, the AWSs and Googles of the world, IBMs and Oracles and cloud hosting environments, um, it's not that. It's going to be the edge computing that will actually proliferate. Um, whilst we always say software is eating the world, in, it's definitely powering it, but it's also polluting it. And so there is early stage evolution, particularly in the change out of the ways cryptocurrency is being able to be mined and minted. Uh, and I'm, uh, I remain very positive uh, about the outcome of, of that, uh, particularly in the Ethereum uh, community. But I do think that we're still not addressing the core issues around the hard things about the hard things. And the problems associated with changing our infrastructure are largely going to be solved. Governments will bring in their incentivizations and policies to enact that. There'll be extended producer responsibilities that will come in to various different industries. But the hard work is going to be in that scope three. And without having the enablement of provenance at the core of everything that we do, um, we're not going to achieve it. The power is going to shift. I think we need more entrepreneurs and data engineers and data scientists at the table, leading companies. Um, but not only that, the fundamentals actually now, the most powerful person in every person's organisation is guess what? It's the procurement officer. It's that person who sits there, is responsible to buy stuff. And that is the role in the organisation that is the incumbent person that has the responsibility. Government is the largest procurer of goods and services, and that's where we can actually press that rib um, and begin to ask a lot more principal yeah. questions about provenance. Lucy, good job. The first one to interject. I like it. Um, I Hi. just wanted to quickly, maybe just the, the comments on cryptocurrency just sparked something. Um, so I talked earlier about the intermittency of renewables and um, this means that in some circumstances you, you might have too little energy on the system for demand and this is when uh, you can deploy techniques like demand side response which is to be able to shift people's time of use or perhaps uh, fall back on local storage. Um, but there may be some times when you effectively have too much uh, clean energy on the grid and therefore you need to take that off to keep the grid in balance. Um, and actually that throws up some really interesting possibilities because um, one of the ways you can do that would is actually to be able to co-locate some quite energy intensive industries um, next to that generation infrastructure. So for instance, if you have a field of uh, solar PV or you've got a, a wind development, for instance, you can actually co-locate industries um, which you can sort of use flexibly so you can switch them on or, on or off. So for instance, you could have an, a a situation in which you have excess clean energy and you are using that. You're taking it off the system by mining cryptocurrency. So I think these are some of the kind of slightly more creative, um, unusual business models um, and setups that we might see start to emerge uh, over the next decade or two. Amanda, these, there's a lot of things here which I know you have an opinion on and you're being extremely polite. Jump in. I've been extremely polite. Um, just picking up on what Leanne was saying about the supply chain and procurement, one of the things that has really changed the face of technology in the last decade is Git and the Git repos and the ability, because of open source software, for organizations to just go and take the code they want. And I'm going to challenge you, Leanne. I don't think the procurement officer or the legal team, which I was leading for decades in my organizations, I don't think they have the power they used to have. And I think there's a clear and defined shift to the CTO, the CIO, the technologist, the developer. And I think we're moving within organizations to developer-driven businesses where the developer can go and take from GitHub, GitLab, whichever repo they're using, kick the tires on something, use it. And only then, when they decide that they want to buy support or enhancements or some sort of enablement, do they need to go through those procurements. And I think actually there is an opportunity through open source in that technical way of circumventing some of the problems that we see in procurement. 
Are you going to take that bait, Leanne? Or? Um, I mean, in, in, in a pull-down world of open source, but we're still sitting in the world of the physicality of goods to run servers. And so um, the power shift will eventually go back into procurement. It might be led by policy change by the CTO or the CEO of the organisation, but ultimately they are the stage gate holder of allowing things to pass in and out of the organisation. So let's see. I'll be around in a nursing home in the next 20 years and watch it from the <laughs> sideline. Well, we might still be debating it there. I think a new bucket is emerging for the blueprint, by the way. Where's John, our, our maintainer, our <laughs> officially newly appointed maintainer? So I'm going to end this panel with just something I learned from you last night, Max. And you know I'm a big fan of the donut economics model. You know I've been tracking what's going on in Amsterdam. And all of a sudden, over dinner, you reveal a few projects I had no idea about that you were involved. Do you want to share that? Uh, sure. I, I think I also want to comment just to, to the previous point, because there, there's something that, 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 that's very important to realize. So software dictates infrastructure, right? So a lot of the things that, that, that you guys mentioned, um, and we, you, you mentioned now turning off a data center in favor of energy, right? The economics are not there. I can tell you that. We've looked at that. That's makes no sense to ever turn off a data center. Why? Because software requires 99.9999% availability. And I always love to ask, like, does your mom's WordPress blog with the recipes really need bank level physical infrastructure, right? But at the moment, we've basically built digital infrastructure that every application is always available. And now we're building, we have telcos pushing us to say, hey, we need 5G. Actually, we don't. What we need is a delay tolerant internet. We don't need less latency. We need applications to be less latency sensitive because then we could build infrastructure in a much more sustainable and flexible way, right? And I just want you all to be aware that, again, we write software. I'm a software engineer. I write code. I, I deploy it somewhere. I don't really think about, you know, it just needs to work. And my CEO says, hey, it needs to work. Um, so, so that's what I'm doing. But there, there's a larger consequence of that, especially now with software at scale. And, and blockchain is a, or, or Bitcoin, really precisely, is when open source goes bad at scale because the original inventor was like, oh, this is cool, it's interesting, but if you do that at scale, that basically means you need to buy new chips every single year to, to basically be able to participate in this algorithmic market. Um, and just consequence thinking and, and digital ethics, I think, is an is a important point. I never make friends at these things because I'm very harsh, so apologies. Uh, to your actual question in, in Amsterdam, I think, so cloud is interesting, right? Is competition is a good thing, right? So, so sustainability is, is nice, but you, sustainability in the original meaning of the word is balancing environment, society, and economics. So the economic part is also important because ultimately when you have competition, it leads to more efficient and most of the time better solutions. And so what we're doing in Amsterdam with the city is to basically say, okay, how do we enable more competition for regional cloud? So, so how do we empower local IT companies to build their own cloud using open source technology, open hardware, refurbished hardware, um, and just enable more infrastructure that looks differently, acts differently, and is maybe overall much, much more sustainable and much more regional. Because the future cannot be that, that we run everything on, on yeah, three or four cloud platforms. That, that it, will, it will inhibit innovation, it will inhibit sustainability, because it, it slows things down rather than accelerating it. So we should rename it to the Tulip Blueprint so they can use it locally as well. Yes, ideally, yes. Join me in thanking these wonderful panels. I always learn when I speak to them.